The satellites that you use every day to get around are literally time traveling into the future. Their clocks run slightly faster than ours. This isn't an illusion, it's not a trick or a technicality, this is real time travel, or more accurately, time dilation. When you use GPS, you're sending a radio wave up into space. That radio wave travels at the speed of light and contains information about when it was sent. The time it was sent is then used by the satellite to calculate distance by comparing it to its own internal clock. But the satellite is only 19,000 kilometers away from you and light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. So these clocks need to be extremely precise. If they're not, they'll miscalculate the distance by an enormous margin. This is why on board every GPS satellite, there is an atomic clock, which ticks at the rate of nanoseconds, a one billionth of a second. In that short time, light only travels 29 centimeters. So GPSs have a certain threshold for accuracy of about 20 to 30 nanoseconds. But this is where the whole time traveling thing comes in. Einstein's theory of general relativity shows us that any object that experiences less gravity should experience time more quickly. Being 19,000 kilometers away from Earth's gravitational pull means that these ultra-precise clocks tick slightly faster than identical clocks down on Earth. The rate by which the satellite is moving into the future is about 38 microseconds a day. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 38 thousand nanoseconds, way off the accuracy target. If these time dilation effects weren't taken into account, these GPS positioning services would be wrong after just two minutes down here on Earth. And after a day, they'd wrongly predict your position with a margin of error of 10 kilometers. Scientists literally had to design clocks that ticked slower to take account for the satellite's future time. But even though they're time traveling into the future, that doesn't stop them avoiding collisions with each other. In 2009, two communication satellites, Cosmos 2251 and Iridium 33, collided with one another over northern Russia. Part of the Cosmos satellite missed the International Space Station by just 120 meters, and the resulting debris that fell into the atmosphere was said to have created sonic booms in Kentucky Texas and New Mexico. But NASA claims that instead of it being their satellite, it was probably more likely a meteorite shower. And this is where the satellite Iridium 33 and the dinosaurs share some common ground. Just as the extinction of the Iridium 33 satellite was mistaken for a meteorite shower, the meteor that brought the extinction of the dinosaurs also brought Iridium the element to our planet. Iridium is pretty unique. It's the most corrosion resistant element on the periodic table. It's almost as unreactive as gold. And for that reason, it was alloyed with platinum by the French and used as an exact measurement of a meter for almost a hundred years called the standard meter. We don't use that now. Instead, we use light in a vacuum. But the original definition of a meter is one ten millionth the distance from the equator to the North Pole. Iridium is used as a hardening agent for platinum. It's alloyed with osmium to create fountain pen nibs, and it's also used in compass bearings. But what Iridium probably can't tell us is, would a compass work on another planet? Compasses only work on Earth because it has a magnetic field, which is created by the electrical charges generated by the flow of liquid metal in our planet's core, as well as the rotation of Earth on its axis. As well as attracting compasses, these magnetic fields repel a lot of solar radiation fired at us from the sun. You can literally see it interacting with our magnetic field. If we didn't have this magnetic field, our planet's atmosphere would be slowly stripped away by this solar radiation. Mars, for example, does not have liquid metal moving around its core, so it doesn't have a magnetic field. If you wanted to use a compass on Mars, it simply wouldn't work. There are areas of Mars which are more magnetic than others, but it doesn't have a magnetic north and south pole. 
And this is the same reason why we think Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. Without a magnetic field, it has no defense against the solar radiation, and so its atmosphere was eradicated by it. But gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn have much stronger magnetic fields. Jupiter's, for example, is 16 times stronger than our own, which begs the question, if we put Jupiter and Earth right next to each other, north to north, would they repel each other like cosmic magnets? Jupiter's gravitational forces are far, far greater than its magnetic forces. The repulsive magnetic forces would never outweigh the attractive gravitational forces. But what if we used something stronger, like a magnetar? Magnetars are a special kind of neutron star. All stars fuse hydrogen in their cores into helium. The energy that that reaction creates is what keeps them from collapsing under their own weight, and as a byproduct, is what gives off the heat and light energy needed for life on this planet to exist. As the hydrogen starts to run out, the pressure increases, meaning that the helium starts to fuse into oxygen and carbon. With incredibly massive stars, far greater than the size of our sun, these reactions continue all the way up increasingly larger elements to nickel and iron. When a star reaches this point, no matter the pressure, no further fusion reactions release energy, and so there's nothing to keep it from collapsing under its own weight. The atomic nuclei of the iron and nickel literally buckle under the incomprehensible pressure. Stray electrons get shoved into the nearest protons, converting them into neutrons. The neutrons themselves remain neutrons, giving a fickle lifeline to the star. There's only so many neutrons that you can pack into a certain space, which is called degeneracy pressure. Neutron stars are effectively mountain-sized atomic nuclei, making them one of the densest things in the universe. If you took a teaspoon-sized blob of neutron star and dropped it onto our planet, it would fall through the Earth's crust to the center of our planet like firing a bullet through paper. It would also, as a side note, weigh something like a hundred million tons. These neutron stars also spin at absurd speeds, in some cases more than a hundred times a second, faster than the speed of a blender. The star's intense speeds and insane densities mean that within 10 seconds of being born, neutron stars are the most magnetic object in the universe, with magnetic fields a trillion times stronger than what we experience on Earth. We often talk about the terror of a black hole and being near it, the idea of spaghettification, where our atoms are pulled apart thanks to the increasing gravitational pull, where our feet feel thousands of times stronger gravity than our heads, and so we are slowly stretched out until we're as thin as human spaghetti. But magnetars are no better. Even a thousand kilometers away, the magnetic field is strong enough to interrupt the bioelectrical signals in your nerves, rendering them hilariously useless. But worse still, the electrical charges of the atoms that make up your body would react to this magnetic field. Their electrons would be ripped from their nuclei, and you would effectively dissolve into a soup of atomic nuclei. And thanks to the magnetic forces, these particles are whipped round the star at a healthy fraction of the speed of light. As they collide with photons, they energize them and turn them into x-rays, which only get funneled back into the neutron star to be re-emitted as an explosion of gamma rays. Gamma rays are extraordinarily dangerous. They are the cosmic equivalent of a 50 caliber bullet, but for planets. In 2004, a magnetar 50,000 light years away emitted a gamma ray burst which almost destroyed our ionosphere, a very important part of our atmosphere. Had the magnetar been closer, it would have gone straight through to our atmosphere and cleansed it of its ozone layer. The UV would then descend on this planet ruthlessly, ripping apart our DNA as if it had just been hit by a bowling ball. Skin cancer rates would skyrocket, but that would be the least 
of our problems. The majority of plant life on our planet would die out, knocking over global food chains as if it were a giant Jenga tower. We would starve long before the skin cancer even became noticeable. This would be a mass extinction event. On our galactic scale, it's like we are sitting in a small room with a Gatling gun, spinning around, firing 50 caliber bullets at us at random, and we're effectively cowering in the corner, hoping that they continue to miss us. Except it's even worse because there are a lot of neutron stars out there. So it'd be more like sitting in a small room playing the highest stakes game of Russian roulette with multiple rotating Gatling guns. Far out, man, is the reason that we're not already dead. We are literally far out in our galaxy. In the Milky Way, the majority of stars orbit 6,500 light years from the center. We, on the other hand, are 32,000 light years away. In our quieter neighborhood with significantly lower gamma ray crime rates, it's extremely unlikely that we would be hit by one of these stray cosmic cannons of catastrophe at close range. But if we were, don't worry, because I will take the bullet for you. Because I love you. Seriously. Thank you very much for watching.